We can take America for God by giving the ministry to laymen who are using their gifts to grow their groups, to double their classes every two years or less. If we can perfect the skill of doubling a class every two years or less, you couldn't build buildings fast enough, you couldn't start new services fast enough, you couldn't launch new churches fast enough to contain the growth that would result if we can perfect the skill of doubling a class every two years or less. We can do it through five steps. By teaching a halfway decent lesson each and every week, nothing less will do. You don't have to be Chuck Swindoll to double a Sunday school class, but it does have to be halfway decent each and every week, nothing less will do. And then we can do it by inviting every member and every prospect to every fellowship every month. We can do it through a kind of party-driven strategy modeled for us by Levi. We're going to finally look at that verse uh, in, in a moment. We can do it by giving Friday nights to Jesus, which really is a subset of that second point. We can do it by encouraging the group toward ministry, getting the whole group involved in the work, not you doing the work of 10 men, but getting 10 men or 10 women in the work, and getting in-reach leaders and outreach leaders and fellowship leaders and prayer leaders and class presidents to work together and do evangelism as a team and work as a micro church, advancing the kingdom together. Together, And ultimately, we can do it by reproducing our group. That is, doubling a class every two years or less is not so much about going from one group to, uh, is not so much, excuse me, about going from 10 to 20 as much as it's about going from one group to two groups. And if you can perfect that skill, an average Sunday school teacher teaching 10 people, doubling every 18 months can reach 1,000 people in 10 years. Uh, through the power of multiplication. I want us to dive in to uh, the second and third point there, inviting every member and every prospect to every fellowship every month. Uh, let's look at what the Bible says. The scripture says in the book of Luke, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said, and Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. And we talked last night about the fact that we all have an inclination to want to just, when good news comes our way, to tell people about that. And I believe at this point, Levi was dealing with this. Levi was feeling this sensation. How can I get this message about Jesus down to these beer-drinking party-loving, fun-loving, crass course, dirty joke-telling pagans at the IRS office where Levi worked. And uh, we're not sure what he thought about, but we do know what he came up with, and that is the very, very next verse. Levi held a great banquet. Levi threw a party. Levi's strategy, his number one go-to uh, strategy for reaching his beer-drinking, party-loving, fun-loving, crass course pagans from the IRS office where Levi worked was, he said, I think I'll throw a great banquet, throw a party for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with him. Now, the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect didn't like this idea so well, and they complained, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus explained to them, well, the reason is, uh, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. And I believe this strategy works especially well. This Levi modeled strategy works for us especially well in this generation because sociologists looking at the culture in this generation have said there is an epidemic of loneliness in the culture. There's an epidemic of loneliness in the culture. I've been teaching on this for a long time, and the last few years I decided to do a little additional research. So I went on Amazon and I looked for some books on loneliness. I discovered one book, for example, called The Medical Consequence of Loneliness. I looked at another book. Um, uh, John Ortberg's got a great book called Everybody Seems Normal Till You Get to Know Them. And uh, that's a pretty good book, by the way. Uh, and he got me onto another book by Robert Putnam uh, called Bowling Alone. Now, this is not your garden variety average uh, book where just some, you know, pontificator guesses what he thinks is going on based on his own uh, circle of influence and his, his own circle of experience. Uh, it was a carefully researched, well-documented book where they spent, uh, got a big pile of money together, a government grant, 20 or 30 researches over a, a period of time, and they carefully carefully, painstakingly uncovered what has been going on in American culture over the last hundred years. And this is what they discovered. During the first two-thirds, up until about the mid-60s, during the first two-thirds of now the last century, Americans took a more and more active role in the social and political lives of their communities, in churches and around card tables and dinner tables. Year by year, we gave more generously to charity. We pitched in more often in community projects, and we behaved in an increasingly more trustworthy manner toward one another through about the two-thirds point of the last century, through about the mid-60s. Then, mysteriously, and more or less simultaneously, we began to do all of this stuff less often. 
We began to play, with our, play cards with our friends less often. We began to join unions less often. We began to join the PTA less often. And we began to come to church less often. We began to do all of this stuff less often. And lest you think he's just making this stuff up, he actually has a bunch of graphs in the back of the book that demonstrate what he's talking about. I made a copy of a few of them here. Here is participation in associations. And you can see this gradual 10 upward. There's a little dip during the years of the Great Depression. But you see this gradual trend upward until about the 60s. The trend line begins to kind of uh, plateau off for, for a decade or so there and then decline over the last 30 or 40 years. And in a similar way, you see a similar trend line in associ uh, excuse me, unions where it goes up and up and up and then uh, plateaus for a while and then it, de it declines over the last 30 or 40 years. The PTA shows an especially dramatic trend line where it goes up like a rocket and down like a rock. And uh, it, it, these next several graphs, notice the last one, if you, if you looked carefully, they had uh, some vertical lines that represented decades. And these also have some vertical lines that represent decades, but you notice there's not as many of them. And so this is showing you only what's going on in the last 40 or 50 years, but you see what's going on in terms of participation in organizations over the last 50 or so years, and you see that decline. Informal socializing has been going down. Uh, next slide, if you will. Uh, participation in clubs has been on the decline over the next uh, several Several years, uh, card playing with your friends, where I will even to track how often you play cards, and as it turns out, you're not playing cards with your friends as often as you used to. And the book gets its title from this graph right here. The name of the book is Bowling Alone by Robert Putnam, and it, it gets its title from this book, book uh, this graph. Notice that this is not bowling per se, it's bowling leagues. And the top line uh, represents how often men join bowling leagues. The bottom line demonstrates how often women join bowling leagues. In fact, I had a bowling alley owner came up to me after a conference uh, sometime back, and he said, you know what? That stuff is not theory to me. I've seen that stuff lived out before my eyes. I, that's business to me. That's life to me. And, and I can tell you, I can verify for you, that is absolutely the truth. And the result is there is an epidemic of loneliness in our culture because of these kind of things. Uh, people who are not in a group are twice as likely to die in the next year as those who are in a group. Now there's good news right there, isn't there? That's good news for your Sunday school. People in, who are in a group are twice as likely, who are not in a group, excuse me, are twice as likely to die as those who are in a group. Those uh, joining a group has roughly the same health benefit as joining a gym or quitting smoking. That's good news right there. That was based on the Alameda study, that out, uh, Alameda County, uh, California, where they did a longitudinal study of uh, quite a number of people, whole community of people over a long period of time, and that's what they discovered. Uh, here is another one. People who have strong social connections but poor health habits, that is, their eating, their exercise, etc., are just as healthy as people with good health habits but weak social connections. I got it right that time. Now, if you got lost in some of the adjectives there, let me just summarize this the way, uh, paraphrase this in a sense, the way John Ortberg does. Better to eat Twinkies with friends than broccoli alone. Can I get an amen? That's good news not right there. And I think the body is speaking to us at a kind of biological level about the fact that we need community. Now, we know this is true theologically. We can study in the Bible that the Bible says over and over, love one another, encourage one another, uh, bear with one another, uh, show mercy to one another, forgive one another, greet one another. And we know that we are created in the image of a God who is, in a way, the original small group. God in himself is, a, is the original small group in that he is a Trinitarian being and we are created in his image and we are crea created with a need for community. Uh, and, I, and truthfully, sometimes in some of our churches, I think we've kind of given up this point. I heard a preacher preaching a year or two back, and you know what? You can get a preach in a house full of people and get a house full of a, a Baptists to say amen at this point, because he was preaching in a way, a way, and he said, you know what? Somewhere along the line, you're going to come to the end of your rope, and when you come to the end of your rope and all you have is Jesus, you'll discover Jesus is enough. Now, that makes real good preaching, but you know what? I actually don't think it's true. I don't think Jesus is enough. I think you also need the Bible. You need the promises of Scripture. You need the comfort of the Holy Spirit. You need the presence of the Father. And I believe you also need the community that God gave us called the church. That we need not only a vertical relationship with God, 
but we also need a horizontal relationship with one another. And I think the body is speaking to us at kind of a biological level about what the Bible say, says is true, that we need community. There's kind of a song in the Old Testament where the scripture says, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and it was good, and then the song changes, and it says, and it was not good. Does anybody remember what was not good? Anyone remember? It was not good that man would be alone, right? Here was a perfect man in a perfect garden with a perfect relationship with God. We're fond of talking about the fact that we all have a kind of God-shaped vacuum, and it's true. We do have a God-shaped vacuum. And money or possessions or uh, a career advancement or whatever are not going to fill that kind of God-shaped vacuum. That's true. But did you know what's also true? We have a kind of people-shaped vacuum that God himself will not fill here is a perfect man in a perfect garden with a perfect relationship with God. God is perfectly filling his God-shaped vacuum. Everything is fine right there. And God looks down and says, it's not good. It's not good that man would be alone. In a, and in our zeal to want to exalt Christ and talk about the importance of a relationship with God, we need to be careful that we don't downplay the importance of a relationship with, with one another. And I think, as I say, the body is speaking to us at a kind of a biological level about that. Uh, here is my favorite one. One study injected 270 people with a virus that causes the common cold. This was written up in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And what they discovered is those with strong social connections, and by the way, uh, these two groups, there was a factor, a difference by about four to one was not a subtle difference between the two. By a factor of about four to one, those with strong social connections didn't get a sick by a factor of about four to one. When they did get sick, they didn't stay sick as long by a factor of about four to one. Now, I'm not sure if this next one was by a factor of about four to one or not, but the research indicates that they produced less mucus and more mucus than the less connected group. Which, you know, we commonly say about uh, unfriendly people, what we say about them really is true. They really are snottier than the rest of us. And we've got the, the uh, data to back it up right, right here. And I think, again, the, bo the body is speaking to us at a kind of biological level about the need we have for community. Um, and uh, this epidemic of loneliness creates a kind of opportunity for us. I grew up as a missionary's kid in the Philippines, and one of the rules on the mission field is you use the felt needs of a culture to reach that culture. So we, if we find a culture that is hungry for physical bread, we find that they are far more likely to listen to a message about the bread of life if we attend first to their need for physical bread. And in this culture in North America, for many of us, the great need of the hour is not for physical bread. There's another need. But in this culture, it creates a kind of opportunity for us that if we will love people in common, ordinary, pedestrian ways, stated a different way, if we will be their friend, their heart will begin to open up about a message of what a friend we can have in Jesus. If you want to double your class every two years or less, don't invite people to class. Instead, invite them to the party. And I've seen it happen more times than I could count that if I could get them to class, I would not be able to keep them from the, 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 par the party. Uh, two or three times out of my life, just in the last year, on the day of the Super Bowl, for example, I don't know what you guys do on the Super Bowl, a lot of churches have a little bit of controversy about what we ought to do on the Super Bowl because if you ever show up for church on the night of the Super Bowl, you'll find that it's not very well attended. And uh, some people, you know, a lot of people are voting with their feet on this matter. And they're voting against the idea of a Sunday evening service, uh, not in business meeting, but just with their feet, so to, so to speak. So many of them, in fact, that some people have had the audacity to actually bring it up in business meeting. I think we ought to cancel some. I think some of them is kind of just graciousness to the pastor. You know, the pastor and the minister of music got to come down here and they're just about the only ones that show up. So, you know, let's, uh, let's give them a break. And I don't care how you spend that in business meeting, it doesn't sound all that spiritual. It just doesn't sound like all that godly a deal to uh, say we want to cancel our Sunday night service. Well, I'm going to go out on a limb here and say I think the most spiritual thing that you can do is cancel your Sunday night service on the night of the Super Bowl. 
Now, the good news here, if you disagree with me, and there are always a few people who disagree with me at nearly every point along the way, but if you would disagree with me at this point, you can still double your class in two years or less, and you don't have to do the Super Bowl thing. You can, but you don't have to. But a lot of churches have done a kind of big group uh, 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 fellowship hall, put the game on a big screen TV like that, and you can do that if you want. Truthfully, I think you're better off doing it as a class by class, not a whole church event, but a class by class kind of event. If you got somebody in your class that has a big screen TV, uh, they're a perfect candidate. And just, by the way, this whole strategy works a lot better if you would buy you a big screen TV. I believe it's God's will that you buy a big screen TV. Uh, I saw recently where I think it's Mitsubishi now has an 82-inch TV. I think if you bought a TV like that, revival might break out. Uh, good things might happen if you would spend the money on a TV. Now, I can't prove that. That's just a guess on my part. But uh, at any rate, this whole strategy works a little bit better if you got a big screen TV. So I do have a big screen TV. I'm paying the price to make this thing work, you know, sacrificing for Jesus here. All right, and so we got this big screen TV. On the day of the Super Bowl, we had a house full of people over. And as two of them were leaving, I overheard them. They didn't actually say this to me. They said it to each other. But I overheard them saying to each other, you still got that Bible study going on Tuesday night? And I might mention in passing that my expression of group life the last several years has been a Tuesday, sometimes a Thursday, but uh, uh, more often a Tuesday night group. And that is not because of some grand uh, philosophical preference for uh, uh, home groups as opposed to Sunday school style groups. To me, a group is a group is a group. And whether that group meets on Sunday morning or that group meets on Tuesday night, a group is a group is a group. And it just turns out for me, I'm gone about 40 Sundays a year, and so uh, Sunday morning doesn't work out all that well. When I'm in, in, uh, in town on Sunday, I do go to a Sunday school class. But I'm gone so many Sundays, and I really do love being a part of a group, and so I've been doing this uh, Tuesday night group. And this, these uh, two people had picked up on this and kind of heard a little bit about it, and uh, they wanted to ask, you still got that Bible study going on Tuesday night? Mm -hmm. 